I am joined today, we are joined today on today's episode with Yasmin Williams-Woods. She is a Christian speaker, writer, and YouTuber. She encourages and empowers women with her electrifying messages and equips listeners with actionable motivation anchored in biblical truth. Uh, She is a wife. She is a mother of four we are going to ask her about that for sure, with a passion for Christ and a rich knowledge of God's word. She is on a mission to help women lead lives that are proof that loves, that love conquers all the things that we face, feel fear, and stand in faith for. I love it, Yasmin. Thank you so much for joining me today. It is truly my pleasure. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. Well, tell us a bit about yourself, about how you got into the space that you're in, becoming a speaker and wanting to encourage and motivate women. Yeah. um, Me, in a nutshell, I am a whole hot mess, as um, I often say. And um, you mentioned I have four kids. So I became a mom at the age of 14 and by the grace of God, just experienced a lot of um, a lot of fruit and a lot of joy and peace and opportunity. And from there, I just, you know, you look at life and you see how good God has been to you. I just wanted people to know the Jesus that I know. And so I started to share that. Um, But just in a friendship, that's just naturally who I am kind of way. And at some point, a friend was like, you should start a YouTube channel. And um, I do not like technology, y'all. I don't get it. I don't understand it's not how my mind works. I'm feelings and words and emotions and all that technology. When I touch people, like human touch. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, my husband is the complete opposite. Not the complete opposite, but he is my, he knows all the things. I don't. And so I was like, mm, no, I don't. And so I started doing YouTube and um, things just happened. And so from there, I've, I'm learning that God often tells us to do things that he knows we can't do. And the whole point is like, you can't do it unless you lean Mm -hmm. on me. And as succinctly as possible, that that's kind of how I got here to this place. Just leaning on God, trusting God, obeying Mm -hmm. his voice, even in moments where I was like, "Mm, this makes absolutely no sense. And Mm -hmm. it's never going to work. Have you always been a Christian? I was raised as a Christian. I, so indirectly, yes, but for myself, I did not begin a relationship with Jesus until I was about 22. But yes, Mm -hmm. he's all, obviously he's always been present in my life. I just Mm -hmm. hadn't always um, been present in, in his life or in, in his wheel, in his way. Yeah. So let's kind of start at the beginning. You've opened up before about being raised by a single mom. What was that like? Yeah. Um, As a child, it just seemed normal. I Mm -hmm. am from a small town in Alabama and, I mean, um, raised in an environment where poverty or all the things that come with a vulnerable society were pretty prevalent to me. So to be raised by a single mom was like, oh, everybody's raised by a single mom. I can say, however, it also meant that there were certain luxuries that we, we didn't have, um, in terms of like the nice, the nicer things or the family vacations or the going out to eat, just simple things like that. But one thing that we always, always had was, um, my mom's love, which I talk about all the time because it is the epitome of Christ like love. And that's why I feel now that like love really does conquer all love. Absolutely never fails because while it seems like we had nothing, I know that I am who I am now because we had everything and what, Mm. because we had the love of Jesus Christ. Hmm. When, when did, so your mom, clearly a very pivotal woman in your life, how did she balance being a single mom? So how did she have to, I mean, she had the burden of the family bringing in all the income, but also needed to be there with y'all. How did you see her do this well? 
this is y'all. I'm so sorry. This is going to sound so cliche. I'm sorry, sorry that every answer goes back to God, but it just really is the truth in my life. But I saw her operate in his grace. It never once looks like it was a struggle for her. Whereas like now in my life, if I don't have something that I need or I have a deadline, like I, I have struggled with anxiety and just going through seasons where I have to really be stretched in my faith or my trust and dependence on God. But for my mom, she never seemed to be overwhelmed or stressed. And I know as a woman now that she most certainly was, but she made, she, she did what she had to do. She made it work. She, and then I'm the youngest of three girls. So I also have two older sisters who were a huge help as well in terms of, um, driving me places or, you know, cooking, Mm -hmm. cleaning, doing all the things. Yeah. Now, was your mom a Christian as well? Always a Christian when you were growing up? Always a Christian. So how did she react when you got pregnant at 14? Woo! Um, like Christ. So, so loving, so kind, and so forgiving. So I did not tell anyone that I was expecting until I went into labor. What? In labor, yes. In labor. And the only reason I, I shared then is because I thought I was dying. I literally thought it never crossed my mind that I was going in labor. I just thought I was dying. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to, like, I need help. I have to tell my mother, my family, um, that I'm pregnant because I need help. And like, even in this moment, I just hear like, that's a, that's a word of encouragement for somebody of like, we guilt go through life and things get hard and we're like, we're desperate Mm -hmm. and our situation is dire and we feel like we're dying, but know that that's the very place where God wants us to speak and call Mm -hmm. out for him. Um, so that he can help us. So, because only he can save us. So I felt like I was dying and I went into my mom's bedroom. It was the middle of the night and probably around 5 a.m., so early morning, actually. And I woke her up, or I crawled into bed with her. I woke her up, and I said, I'm pregnant. And so she asked, she's like, she said, so you're having a baby, which retrospective is hilarious because if I'm pregnant, then I'm having a baby. And <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, and that was all she said. So she got up and started to get ready for work. Mind you, I'm still dying but I don't know what to do at this point because that's all she said so she prepares to go for work my sister picked her up for work and I walk out with her and my sister's like where is she's going and my mom said I guess she's going to the hospital so went to the hospital by the time I got there my like I'd gone into full labor in my sister's car so um and y'all I'm sorry if this is TMI but and then so my son was actually born I was on the stretcher the hospital bed or whatever um but he was fully delivered on the elevator by physicians thankfully that we'd gotten physicians by that point but yeah that was her reaction and (laughs) and so after by the time we get to the hospital room it's kind of like this is life this is our reality so we were sitting around the bed my mom my oldest sister and her husband and we just started thinking about um, names. And we decided my son's name is Joshua. His middle initial is C. My mom chose Joshua, biblical Christian lover. And we decided middle initial C because we were like, you know, Josh really is a a miracle from Jesus Christ. And that's how we, that's how we got there. That is insane. How did you hide that you were pregnant? I... Well, I'm I'm fairly small size. So when I when I was pregnant, I it just looked like I was going through puberty like most 14-year-old girls do. Like I was growing boobs, which I no longer have, um and just <laughs> hips and wait. So I was like becoming a little curvy more than anything until the end um by month 8 it was pretty obvious. So one it, I just looked like I was gaining normal weight. And then the second thing is I did all the things I would normally do. Like I was on the cheerleading squad. I was in theater productions. I, I did all the things um, uh, that a normal high schooler would do. And I think in that 
people just like, oh, feel like, oh, it's just normal. So what was life like for you? You're 14 years old and you've just delivered your son. Ignorance is bliss. And for anybody listening, I have to apologize because it's not like this profound story of like, I struggled and then I overcame. I just was completely naive. And I think that's like, Mm. incomprehensible peace, peace that transcends understanding is what I experienced. So I had my son. And at that point, it really was like, okay, what do I do to make our lives better? And so Mm. I I love school. I love school. I love learning. I just, I love it. Um, And so I'd always done well in school. And I just was like, okay, I got to like do even better now. So I was, by the grace of God, able to graduate valedictorian of my high school class. I was able to go on to college, graduate college, do all the things. And um, so that became my focus. I just became so fixated Mm -hmm. on, on, I guess, earthly success or just making things different. So there wasn't any time to worry about like, this is hard, this is difficult, this is challenging. I think my most difficult seasons of life actually came um, probably within the last decade. And that's when I met my husband and we had more children and we had to blend a family. And that's when, that's when life really, really got crazy. And Kimberly, you asked me at the beginning, how did I, um, How did I reach this point of sharing God's truth with with other women? It was in that season when life became overwhelmingly too much, because by that time I had already like I'd been following Jesus. I was ministering. I was serving. I was studying his word. I had, you know, I checked all the success boxes in addition to really growing in my faith. So I didn't understand why life had gotten so unbearably hard. So you know, the Bible tells us seeking you will find. So I went seeking through Mm -hmm. scripture of like, no, how do I endure? How do I overcome? How do I persevere? How do I grow? How do I remain strengthened? And as I find answers, because I don't have them all, but as I find answers, I'm like, okay, let me tell all the people because we need to know. Yeah. What are, would you share more or go deeper into a story about what some of those hardest parts of the past decade of your life have been? What are, what are some of those difficult moments that you got to? Yeah, I, I would have to say, Ooh, that one caught me off. So I'm like, where do I start? I feel that in my, in my marriage, like I was raised by a single mom and Mm -hmm. I was a single mom for nine years And my mom was very strong and is very strong and independent. And I am very strong, Mm -hmm. self-sufficient, independent. And I didn't know how to do life with someone else. Mm -hmm. And our relationship with Christ requires us to die to ourselves. I never had to really die to myself because Mm -hmm. like all was well and rainbows and unicorns. However, when you do life with someone, I I started to see that like, oh no, 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 no. I am a hot, broken mess. I have an attitude. I am selfish. I am self-righteous. I am like, because I'm this quote unquote perfect Christian. And so Mm -hmm. I just, I am right. And so it just was really hard to be hit with truth about Mm -hmm. myself. It was really hard to work on those flaws within myself while also seeing that my husband is also a flawed person and sometimes feeling like, well, why am I working on my flaws? I just want to tell this person about their flaws. Um, So yeah, I I think just that, that battle or that challenge of um, dying to flesh was the hardest part and realizing that no matter how much we grow in our faith, the work that Jesus has started will not be finished until um, the day of Jesus Christ when he, when he comes back. So it just was, it was a rude awakening to see that like, Oh, you don't have this figured out. You have not arrived and you desperately need Jesus. Hmm. How do you prioritize time 
with Jesus? How do you, well, I'll just leave that open. How do you, how do you make sure you have the time to spend with him? I, okay. So I do like the morning routine and it varies because y'all I'm very big on, like I'm a mom of four and I am a former educator. So at one point in my life, you know, it meant waking up at five and being out of the door by six. So I'm not someone who's going to be like, yeah. the first thing you do when you wake up, you need to like spend an hour with God. I understand that that's not always feasible and God gives yeah. us grace, but we do have to prioritize starting our day with God in some way. Like I'm a worship. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read the word. Maybe I'm, I don't study scripture until later, but it's just carving out time every single day. And I know we're in seasons where, where we're busy. So some, some seasons have looked like, and I say this now because it's easier for me now to make time for God because um, I do run my ministry. And so I'm always home. Um, or not always, but you know, I just have more time to do that. Mm -hmm. But there have been seasons where my time with God was while I commuted or while I worked yeah. out. It's just finding time or making the time a part of something that you are already mm -hmm. doing. And it's so vital because I am a completely different person mm -hmm. if I have not spent time with Jesus. I, I joke that like Jesus saves. Um, and he does. And he died on the cross and he saved us from our sin. But in today, like literally he saves. He saves my kids from my flesh, from my impatience, from my attitude, from my hanger, all of it. So I have to make time for Jesus or I, I just I'm afraid to think of what might happen. <laughs> How old are your kids? My oldest is 19. I have twin girls who are eight and I have my youngest daughter who is six. Wow. So you are a full life of all of the, the whole spectrum. Yeah. It is exhausting. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> How do you incorporate them either into worship or Bible study or how do you encourage your kids to do it on their own? Yes. So we, we've done a variety of things and kind of, as I was saying about for myself personally, making God a part of just everything that you already do. That's really big for us. I mean, we have our children's devotionals that we follow, that we read, that we listen to. We pray every morning, every night before we get like, and again, before we go into the school day, we do our biblical affirmations and before we leave the house in the morning. And it's just literally a part of every conversation that we have. And mm -hmm. because I want them to see that it's, it's a lifestyle. It is a way of life. It's not this taxing thing that I have to do or I have to make extra time for. It's just, yeah. it's what I, what we do is who we are, is how we live, is how we function. Yeah. Have you had, especially your, your younger kids, like the two eight-year-olds and the six-year-old, ask you questions about the Bible or about Jesus? And it gets to a point where you're like, I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> even my, like even my 19-year-old, because he's in college now. So he sometimes, we, he was just texting me stuff last night. And I can, ha I can, I'm more able to answer his questions, but even still sometimes I'm like, okay, wait, let me pray about it. I'll get back to you. Let me study scripture but my right. girls they want to know all the things about about heaven and when jesus is coming back and mm. and i'm like i don't and what is it what is it like after you die i i mean my kids are all about everything revelations not that they've ever read revelations but i'm just like <laughs> can we start with noah's ark please like, <laughs> go to the basics but they have these complex questions and thoughts often often but I like that they get to hear me say, you know, I don't know, but this is this is what I believe. This is what it means for me. Or this scripture says this. Mm. So this is the way I look at it. But I'm not sure you you should pray about it. So really empowering them to um, mm -hmm. start to lean into their own spirituality and seeking God and trusting God even at even at eight. But they the other mm -hmm. night I'll tell you because I always say. 
before they get out of the car, I always say work hard and put God first. And so Mm -hmm. we, we say this. And the other night, my youngest, she says, what does it mean to put God first? And I was like, great question because I never, you know, I just say this. I've been saying this since Josh was a kid. And, um, and so we had a good conversation on what that means, what that looks like in our choices and our friendships and our, you know, obedience to our teachers or, or whatever. So that was, that was good. Some questions I can answer some of them, some of them I cannot. So that was a good question. Yeah, no, I meant it too. My, my daughter is seven and she's been asking the question recently, um, what is it, how do you hear God? Great question. I said, well, well, so the first thing I said is we can hear him by reading his word, like reading the Bible, but then sometimes you hear him in you. And she's like, how, what does that mean? It's like, ah, how do I explain this to a seven year old? Right. (laughs) But it's so good that they're having the conversations and it's a testament to, uh, you know, to you too, how you parent and how you show up that they're curious and want to know. Yeah, I I I want to start writing down a lot of their questions because some of them are are kind of funny. Like, does God sleep? It's like, well, mm. no. Like the Bible says, God doesn't sleep or slumber. And then she goes, but what about Jesus? Okay, so when Jesus was on Earth, he slept. Yes. Now, do do your little ones ever like call the Bible out to you of like check you with the Bible? <laughs> Not yet. Oh my gosh. Because I I was saying something the other day that was like, I'm not a negative person, but I, I can't, so I can't remember, but it was ultimately not my norm of something that I, I couldn't do. And Ella Rose has done this twice. She'll either tell me, remind me of Philippians 4 and 13, or she'll always remind God doesn't give, give you the spirit of fear because I'm oh. like, oh, I'm just so nervous. And she'll, she just always, Look those are her go-to. And I'm just like, you're right. Okay, <laughs> you're right. Let me let me take the advice that I would give to someone else. Yeah. How do you talk about your faith or Jesus with friends that you have who aren't believers? That's a tough one. I mean, I don't think mm-hmm. it's, it's not a tough question to answer, but it is a tough thing to navigate. Because y'all, I am, I'm, I'm obsessed with him, and I'm crazy about him. So the people in my life, whether they're friends or just acquaintances, mm-hmm. they know that that's who I am and where I stand. But I also, as as they see me and know me, I see them and and hear them as well. So I, it's not like I'm gonna talk about my faith always. But when someone else is sharing about their lives, I'm not going to, and I know that they are not believers, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk about their life in a faith, in a Jesus-centric kind of way. I'm just going to respond lovingly and and with kindness, but I might only say Jesus three times as opposed to 16, (laughs) Um, but... But yeah, I just like, even now we're new to uh, the Austin area Mm -hmm. and I've been meeting moms and many of Mm -hmm. whom are not, or who practice a different religion. And, and it's just, we just have normal human conversations and they're kind Mm -hmm. and they feel like I'm kind and we respect one another. And, but one mom in particular, she texted me the other day. She's like, you're just. I'm just so grateful that I met you and I just feel a connection. And I'm like, I feel the same thing. And God has placed her on my heart in many ways and led me to do things. And in my mind, I'm just like, yeah, girl, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. But I like you, maybe one day I pray that you will get there and see that. But the things that she was saying in the text message, I was like, oh, girl, only if you like knew that it's really mm-hmm. God working and moving. Mm-hmm. But does that answer your question? I'm sorry, because I, I don't know yeah, how I, okay. it's hard to not show up as yourself. Yeah. And who I am as a believer. It's the relationship though, right? I mean, I think that's the key. It's helping people understand you love them and see them as a, as a person, not as like a mission project. Yes, for sure. But I don't, I don't know. There's, there's still, 
sometimes if there's people where I know that they, it's not that just that they aren't Christians, like that they're anti-Christian, like if someone has hurt them or they've been hurt by an experience, then I have, I struggle sometimes with like, do I say more? Do I say less? Like, am I going to push them away? If Mm -hmm. I talk too much about Jesus, like how do I, how do I walk through this with them, but also be my true authentic self without ostracizing them? Yeah. And I I don't know the answer to that. I do feel like I know we were going to um, possibly talk about spiritual attraction. And I think that Mm. exists not just within marriages, but I mean, in discipleship as a whole. So even if even if someone is completely like overtly anti Christ, the church or whatever, we can still operate in relationship with them, authentic relationship, separate from our, I don't want to say separate from our faith because like we can't separate from our faith, but like without a like, I never have to talk to you about Jesus at all, but because of what the term spiritual attraction, no matter what I say or do, Mm -hmm. you're going to see the God in me or you're going to see the light in me and because it's it's mm-hmm. God, because it's power, because um, that's just how Jesus works. So I do think we just continue to show up. I've been talking a lot about how, um, you know, I mentor a lot of teen moms and mm. many of them, some of them, I should say, have never heard of Jesus. And like that was so foreign for me growing up in a small town in Alabama, like yeah. everybody knew Jesus. And so but there are some people um, whom I've been blessed to mentor who had never heard of Jesus. But the conversation, or when you talk about Jesus, they're just completely shut down. Life has been too too overwhelmingly hard. Yeah. And I get it. They're very valid given the, the things that as humans we face. Um, and so conversations will start because I like your earrings or, oh, that's so nice of you. Or, oh, I like that song too. Or, oh my gosh, you're hot. Just these random points of entry to conversation. And I never, I never say Jesus, but as a believer walking in the wheel of God, you don't have to say it without showing it. You don't have to, even if you never say it, people see it. And that's just the beauty of the God whom we serve. And we feel like, I know I'm talking a lot, but I'll wrap this up. We feel like, oh my gosh, I got to like, there's a sense of urgency because we want everybody to know Jesus. And Mm -hmm. I get it because I operate in that same sense of urgency. Like I need you to know him. I need you. I want you to be saved. Jesus wants you to be saved, but we have to know that he is all powerful and he doesn't need us to say, Jesus, Jesus, do here, go here or submit or believe or like repent of your sins. We don't always have to do that. God just wants us to be the vessel. In most cases, like you just show Mm -hmm. up and wear that green shirt. I have somebody, their favorite color is green. They're going to say something about that shirt. And you don't understand that that's really, the shirt is really a seed into my light. So prayerfully, that made sense along the way. I just think we just have to be like, God, I don't know what to do, but I know you know what to do. So I'm just going to show up and use me however you see fit. Like no Mm -hmm. pressure at all. Just show up and do you. How would you answer the question, what what makes someone or what do you believe makes you spiritually attractive? I think total submission. When which is hard. I'm I don't want to make it seem like I I have that all the way figured out, but it is someone whose heart is turned so beautifully toward God where you can't, mm. you can't deny it. And that person, I think so is submission with a heart turned toward God. And mm-hmm. it's also it's humility, which if you're submitted, you're humble because most people who have that powerful spiritual attraction, they don't even, they're mm-hmm. just confused when good things happen to them or when people see good in them, it's just like, 
they're like, oh my gosh, you're kidding. Like, wow, really? They're just floored because they aren't operating from a place of self. It is really like, you know, we talk about less of me and more you got and, and Mm -hmm. people with the most intriguing spiritual attraction are those who are like none of me but Mm -hmm. all of you God like I really show up to serve you I really and in times it's like the people who are even afraid to show up or who are shy or who are hesitant or you know any type of emotion feel like they're not this enough but they do it anyway because it's like I'm not strong enough or smart enough or wealthy enough but God is. So I'm, it's all him, you know, he perfects his strength in our weak places. And I think spiritual attraction are the people who are weak enough to let God be strong. Mm. So good. What are some of your favorite either books like faith-based books or podcasts or things like that, that, that you use to continue learning and growing in your faith? Mm, great question. So I can I think of a book in this season because I love what am I reading right now? I am reading Crazier Faith by Mike Todd. Um, but in general, I love anything that Lisa Turkhurst writes. Like mm-hmm. I am just I, the beauty with which she puts words together are just so powerful. They just resonate with me. And I just feel Holy Spirit speak to me in the way that she writes. So anything, um, Lisa Turkers, I also, um, love Priscilla Shire. I listen Mm -hmm. to a lot of sermons more than, um, podcasts. Like I have a handful of podcasts that I go to, but I, I don't introduce new podcasts, um, often because I spend so much time listening mm-hmm. to sermons on YouTube or um, reading God's word or um, a book, a Christian book that someone has written. Yeah. What is your favorite either? Well, both. So what is your favorite book of the Bible and your favorite extra biblical book? My favorite book of the Bible would have to be I'm going to go with first and second Samuel. I know that's two. I really Mm -hmm. love the story of David. Um, Mm -hmm. My favorite Bible story, however, is in second Kings, but it's just like one story compared to the whole book. So (laughs) I have to go with first and second Kings. And then my favorite book, I'm going to go with two. Neither of them is, they aren't Christian based, but it's the alchemist. And oh, the places you'll go by Dr. Seuss. Mm. So, yes, those are good. Yeah. Well, I've never read The Alchemist. I have no clue what it's about, but oh, the places you'll go is good. <laughs> it's so good, but you got to read The Alchemist at some point. It's what really, is it? Really what is good. it about? It's for me. It is about like following the path that God has placed, like that God ordered for you. It's just, it's just with such a spiritual experience reading that Mm. book, it was cathartic. It was empowering. It was just about being on the journey that God has mapped out for you. Mm. Now, I'm not sure if that's what the author intended, (laughs) um, but I do, I do think that's a part of it, but I went somewhere totally Jesus while reading it. (laughs) So it says, it's a um, magical story. A shepherd boy yearns to travel in search of worldly treasure. Hmm. And so it just wasn't that for, it wasn't the worldly for me. It was like, yes, God, I hear you. Like this, this heavenly treasure that we have through Jesus Christ. I loved it. That's awesome. What words of encouragement would you leave for our listeners that may be going through a hard time or a difficult place or struggling with their faith? So many things. I have to say this to be true to myself. Um, As I mentioned earlier in the conversation, love never fails. So I just want you to know if you are that person in that place, I want you to know that you really can conquer it. You really can get through it with Jesus. 
I mean, my thing on my um, channel and, and most things that I write is conquer life with courageous love. And so we conquer these things that we face mm -hmm. in life by leveraging the work that Jesus did on the cross. Like his, his act of love was so courageous. And if he can conquer death, then surely as his children, as his vessels, as his chosen people, we can conquer the things that we face in life. So I would just want to encourage somebody to keep going, keep trusting, keep believing and um, seek God. I love it, Yasmin. Where can our listeners find you? Yeah, so I am most recently, y'all. I am on TikTok, and girl, yeah, I, yeah, girl. I did not want to do it, <laughs> but it's become a happy place for me. Um, That's great. Yeah, but so on Instagram and TikTok at Yasmin underscore Williams Woods, and then on YouTube, Yasmin Williams Woods, and um, and then my website, YasminWilliamsWoods dot com. That's awesome. Do you have any? projects you're working on or things that you're up to? Always all the things. Um, I don't, I have a new devotional, which you can see all about that on my website or on Amazon. And it's, oh, nice. um, 21 days and it's all about discipline or discipleship over discipline. It's 21 days for a courageous mom. So awesome. check that out. And then I've just been doing some some one-on-one -on -one work with a lot of the women whom I, whom I serve and get to work, who've become a part of, of my ministry that way. But yeah, there's always a new YouTube video every single week. There are all the things, all the things. Awesome. There's a weekly Bible study virtually if you want to join us for that. So yeah. That's cool. That's awesome. Well, we will include all those links in the show notes to your social channels, your YouTube and your website. And Love the devotional. That's um, what a great one. This discipleship over discipline, 21 yes. days. Sounds fantastic. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us, Yasmin. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. The pleasure has been mine. Thank you so much. Here are my key price takeaways from our conversation today with Yasmin Williams Woods. First of all, love conquers all. She said that multiple times. She mentioned that that is what her mom put and instilled into her. It's what she is wanting to put and instill into her kids, in her marriage. And it's been what she has experienced in all of her difficulties. At the end, she even said, courageous acts of love. How can we be doing more of those for the people that we have in our lives? That is my question for you. So many times we look at the struggle in a relationship with our kids, with our spouse, with a friend, and we look at it as something to get through or something to maybe be the end of the relationship. But what if we reframed it and said, how can I show courageous love towards this person, even when the situation makes it difficult to do so? My second key pies takeaway from this episode is the importance of making it intentional to spend time with God. So a Bible study, listening to worship music, having prayer, meditating on his word. What are you doing? And I asked myself this. I am in a season. Oh my gosh. After I broke my foot and all the other things that I did to my foot on my birthday about six months ago, I have just been out of my routine and I feel it when she said that, when she said, you know, me being in that constant discipline of being in communion and contact with God, it, it changes me. And when I don't have that, it changes me. And I totally feel that. My question to you and my question for me is how are you making it intentional to spend time with Jesus? And then my third and final takeaway from our conversation, what does it look like to live in total submission? If that is what can lead us to becoming spiritually attractive, especially as Christians, then are we, are you living in submission to God, to his way, to his will, to his purpose for your life? And in what areas are you living 
in rebellion. And maybe not even in a bad way, but you're just pushing through and trying to continue in your own strength or going against something that you know you shouldn't do. Maybe it's something as simple as gossip. Mm. Maybe it's something like dealing with your jealousy and not being as jealous or envious. Or maybe it's you're doing a bunch of good things, but it's taking time away from the people that God put in your life to serve, like your spouse and your children. How would it look for you to live in total submission to God's will for your life? Until next week, stay strong.